Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Seagull Books and Good Institute, Max Miller Bhavan, Kolkata, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth edition of How Can You Hear What I'm Saying? I Am So Far Away. It is an evening of conversation between two writers organized by the Goethe Institute Masculine Bhavan Kolkata in collaboration with Seagull Books. First, let me begin by introducing you to our guest today, Mr. Yo Lendl, author and publisher. A little bit about Yo Lendl. Yo studied literature, cultural studies, and philosophy. And from 1997, he was involved in setting up the literature program at Dumont Publishing House of which he became publisher in 2010. In addition, he has been a visiting professor and lecturer at the universities of Leipzig, Hildesheim, Munich, and Biel. Jo has been publisher of Hansa Publishing House since 2014. In 2019, Seagull Books published the English translation of his novel, All the Land, translated by Katie Darbyshire. I had the pleasure of editing this translation and of course meeting Yo during his visits to Kolkata where he has lectured at the Seagull School of Publishing. Welcome Yo to our uh, conversation. Uh, the other interlocutor, the other person in the conversation today, hi Yo. Uh, the other person in the conversation today is Sandeep Roy who is a writer, radio host and columnist based in Kolkata. His work has appeared in the New York Times, in the San Francisco Chron Chronicle, Times of India, First Post, and several other publications. His audio dispatch from Kolkata airs weekly on public radio in San Francisco. He is also a columnist for Mint Lounge and hosts the Sandeep Roy Show on Audio Express. His award-winning first novel is called Don't Let Him Know. Uh, before we begin the conversation, I'd like to draw your attention to a scenic reading from Yo Lendl's fascinating novel, All the Land, which can be heard on the webpage of Goethe Institute, Vaskula Bhavan, Kolkata. The reading in English has been done by actor Jayant Kripalani, and Yo has himself read an excerpt from his novel in German. To listen to these, you can go to the Goethe Institute's website as well as their Facebook page. But now let's begin today's conversation. Thank you. And here is the stage to you, Yo and Sandeep. Thank you, Vishan. And uh, Yo Lendl, sort of welcome back to Kolkata, even though <laughs> you're so far away, but uh, we can hear you. Um, you know, a book set uh, in large part in Greenland feels uh, so in the middle of Kolkata's sweltering summer. I'm hoping that in the course of this conversation, we will uh, we will at least vicariously feel a little bit like we're in a little bit of Greenland. Um, but uh, but before we get to that, I you know these conversations I've been uh, beginning by asking all our guests about the only issue that people care about around the world right now, the pandemic. So you know, has the pandemic changed you in any fundamental way, do you think? Any epiphanies? <laughs> it changed me in, in pretty much every uh, issue. The one issue that is, that is uh, especially dear to my heart is that it now reminds me that the last time I've been on a stage was in Kolkata, like hours before the outbreak of the pandemic, together with you um, at the literary festival in February um, 2019, yes, uh, 2020. 2020. And ever since we all freezed to nothing, um, and um, I, when I thought about that, I, I thought it's it's so lovely to be on stage with you again after like for the pretty much first time. Then I realized we are not on a stage. It's just that we got so used that this is the stage uh, these days that we don't even realize the difference. So one epiphany would be a 
would be too big a word, but nevertheless, one thing is that as an international publisher and as a writer who has contacts all over the world, this part of getting in conferences, in discussion groups, in podiums, and in readings internationally uh, became so much easier and accessible, more accessible. That is one thing that is that really changed my life, both as a writer and as a publisher. Um, and I try to stick to this side more than to all the others. Do, do you think that is going to stay with us? Yeah. whenever we, the world goes to whatever normal is going to be. Yeah. And, and there is one, um, you, just to mention one example, uh, twice a year, we get all our sales representatives together and we present them the catalog of the next year and so on. Um, and we do these in, in, in a huge uh, room here, but, but it's limited. So it's always the fights who can join us and, and who can who can be present and now it's for sure that we will we're hoping to to get back together but we will keep the thing that, that everybody can can uh, participate and, and and listen and speak from the outside so it's this more democratic appeal we we um, invite authors from all over the world to present their books themselves during this conference and so on so it's not the th same thing as we also know, but nevertheless, we, we have some advantages. So what has been the impact, though, of the pandemic on publishing over there since you're, you know, you know the major publishing types? We realized that while theater, cinema, uh, concerts and, and everything really suffered, uh, my wife works in the theater and she had a hard time we as both as writers and as publishers at least had the chance that people realized what a wonderful thing to do is just sitting at home and reading and uh, that was one of the things everybody stuck to uh, that this is lovely anyway and i mean everybody said all all the years I wish I, I'd had some time to read all the books I have at home and look what happened. Yeah, we realized that people read more, talk more about books, find new ways of exchange about literature and so on. And said, so that's really an advantage. But our book sales up? Well, our book sales went double pretty much. Um, but this is due to different reasons. I, I, I think in, in all Germany, book sales kept pretty stable because the disadvantage of lockdown from, from bookshops uh, uh, went together with a higher interest of the reading audience. Right. So bookshops are open now, are they? Now, now they're open. Yes. Yeah. And so, but as a publishing house, do you, do you see the great pandemic novels showing up yet? Are people having to start to submit those? Literally 30 minutes after the first lockdown, we got our first uh, uh, pandemic uh, Corona manuscript. And I thought, well, that's a really quick one. And we didn't publish it. Um, th there are some, I think the most interesting one is, um, um, a pandemic novel by Orhan Pamuk, Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning author of Turkey, who started writing his uh, book about a pandemic back in, in, in older times, years before the, the, the actual pandemic. But obviously, you read it with a pretty different view these days. Wow. Because I remember I had this uh, conversation with the writer Jan Martel, and he was saying, and I asked him, and he actually expressed some doubts as to whether there would be a great pandemic novel, because he said, uh, you know, it's almost like the pandemic is being experienced by everybody in such a way that, that he says, I don't see a literal, like, people wanting to read 
that novel again. It has to be yeah. done in a very creative, different way. He was like, this is not like a world war where people who had not experienced the war could experience mm. the war through reading a book. Mm. Um, so he's like, you know, maybe it will have to be done metaphorically or there will have to be a new take. Yeah, the new take will be about what is closeness what is what are ways of interacting in different ways so all these the pandemic is not only about medical questions it's about how we live together um how do we cope in families um how do we cope on our own um how stable or how how, how does it open up wounds uh that worked okay-ish but now in times of difference uh, react in, a, in an unexpected way. So I think novel will care about this and they always cared about these questions, uh, but you will read it differently with a, with a new sensi sensitivity. But there will be many books covering this subject in way more than, <laughs> than would, be, <laughs> would be bearable. But I, 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 I'm, I was always, sure that after the German reunification, the, the critics always expected the big book about the German reunification. And we all knew that it will take probably 20 years. Uh, mm. Same with 9-11. It takes some time until it's time for literature to care about these questions. Well, you said the pandemic is about, um, you know, one of the things that is is about coping on your own, which is a very good segue to of the land. Yeah. Uh, so before I get into that, I wanted to again, as Vishan said, remind people that there is a reading that people can listen to online. And also, if anybody listening has any questions through the course of the conversation, type it in and we'll try and get you to answer those in the course of this conversation. Um, so in all the land, um, the protagonist is this German meteorologist and geophysicist Alfred Wegener. And um, which is also, I realize now, uh, the name of the director of the Get Institute in Kolkata. And she's not oh. here. So I don't know if, they, if there is any relationship in the family with NASA. But, uh, you know, actually, I was just reading a book on the Himalaya by uh, this Indian writer named Stephen Alter. Like sort of a biography of the Himalaya. And there's a one line in there where it says, though the German meteorologist and geophysicist Alfred Wegener first proposed the theory of continental drift in 1912, the fundamental concept was only accepted in the mid 1960s. And uh, I was wondering if people know of him, that's that sort of one thing that he's very famous for. But is that how did you come upon Alfred Wegener? Is that someone you would study in school in Germany? N not really. He, he is not known in a way that Mozart or Einstein or anybody is like public property. Um, um, so I question myself who took away our stable grounds who, who was it that who first questioned that everything we stand on is stable for eternity and so i see him in a line together with uh, with uh, galileo and darwin and sigmund freud so the 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 big uh challenges of what we used to know uh, or what we believed in. Um, so they all made us rethink uh, the position of mankind and uh, the stableness of our, of our world systems. And so I read about him, I read his books and, uh, and I realized wow, this man led an adventurous life. I didn't know that. And so I thought there should be a novel about, about him because he invented this theory of, of drifting continents, because he stayed true to it, even though no one believed him. And because he was a strange guy with all kinds of, I mean, 
he was interested in everything. It turned out that this question was really a, a, an important uh, a, a theory that he made up all kinds of theories throughout his life and he traveled a lot in the, in the Arctic. So there was something to tell about it, but without this basic question, I wouldn't have followed him. Uh, and, and yes, so today he is known for this theory and in Germany, um, the Institute that does all the polar excursions and uh, so is named after him. So he's a, he's a bit in sight. So for those who are not aware of him beyond this theory of continental drift, a lot of this book is also recounts his time when he goes to Greenland and uh, several times actually, not just once. Um, where did, uh, for those who are not aware of him, why did he go to Greenland initially? Um, first of all, because he wanted to, he, he, he would have gone everywhere. Um, um, but Greenland is an, is an important uh, place, not only in terms of metro, metrological questions, um, uh, but also in terms of you, you, you can measure in Greenland the, the shifting of the, of the continents. And the thing is, no one ever was had been in the center of Greenland. The Greenland themselves thought they are strange and uh, bizarre gods living uh, on on the ice shelf. They they, they live just on the on the on the uh, on at the coast. And uh, Nansen had done a bit of a crossing in the south, but close to the to the border. So uh, Alfred Wegener was the first one who dared, first of all, to cross Greenland on skis, very dangerous uh, trip. And then in the end decided to spend a winter in the center of the Greenland ice. Um, he died during this uh, uh, trip, but the, he was interested in being- in in, in extreme positions. And he wanted, he, he, for example, now he's very important because he was the first one who measured the thickness of the, of the Greenland ice. So now you can compare today's situation with the situation 100 years ago. So what is it like for you now after, you know, with this, having written this book, when every day we get these like, reports on climate change and the thickness of ice, I imagine it probably resonates with you somewhat differently. I mean, you have a sort of almost personal connect to it. Yeah, it, it is strange to, to have him in mind and how close he was to all this. I mean, he spent summers and winters uh, walking or skiing in the, in the Alps and, uh, and, and studying the glacier, glacial situation over there, but also in, in, in the Arctic. He would have been sad, and I'm sad with him. And also, because he, he, he wasn't only a scientist, he was also, and that is, that is what interests me in writing a novel about this person, I, I, I wondered how can a man spend so much time up there in the, in the white? Um, um, so I imagine that he, nevertheless, he, he had a family, he was, he had colleagues and everything. I thought he has to have a fundamental solitude or a need to be on his own that makes him go back there every time. That, that relates to your question. He, he, he would have been an easy time to survive a pandemic because he doesn't care about spending a year on his own at home. Yes, but only if, you know, if he could survive the pandemic in the Arctic or yeah. somewhere. If yeah. he had been stuck at yeah. home with family, yeah. and things, he yeah. might have gone crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, uh, and you knew from the beginning that you were going to write a novel versus a, uh, biography, because you say in the afterward that this was a man who 
distrusted novel, so he might have looked very yeah. askance at your... <laughs> Alfred Wegener didn't like novels at all. That was too... I mean, the thing is, he was very much interested in, in phenomenons that you can't really grab. So clouds, the shape of clouds, Fata Morgane, um, uh, uh, the different levels of the air. Um, all these things were very interesting for him. For me, novels are part of this list uh, because they, their main idea is to be not measurable exactly. Um, so that's why, why I love fiction. Um, but that was not the part of, uh, of his list. Um, so there are biographies about Wegener. So I, there was no need to add another one. And I, I was more interested in how does a man, how, what, what's the inside of this person? Um, what questions make him go back there? What, what inner strength makes him stay true to his theory, even though no one cared? Um, and I think that's more the department of a novel than a than a biography to feel the inner uh, energy to 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 live this life. But I, in the beginning, it was a theater piece, but then I thought, oh, I I, I write a, uh, a drama. Then I thought I write a novel about the dramatization on stage. And then I thought, okay, no, let's just write a novel. Did you ever, I mean, did you ever actually do also do a theater piece or are you no, abandoned? No. You should go back and you should, you should have used the pandemic to think about yeah. turning back into a theater piece. Yeah. <laughs> because I think, you know, that is a way to look at the pandemic. But uh, so when, he, when he's, for example, spending his winter in Greenland, pretty much all alone, and there are these graphic accounts in the book of what happened, you know, things we don't think about. What happens if your tooth gets infected in yeah. the middle of winter in Greenland and you don't have access to a dentist? What do you do? And I'll let readers find out what horrific things you get to do. But uh, like beyond the scientific measurements that he was taking, beyond all of that, did his journals actually have, give you a glimpse of what drove him? what he thought about solitude, as you say, the inner Alfred Wegener, or did you yeah. pretty much have to make that up? Both. I would say I am, you read the journals differently if you are on the lookout to these things. So you, you pick <laughs> every small sentence that in there that could possibly, uh, for example, on one moment, he, he he didn't write a lot about. He had three girls, three children, um, and he didn't write a lot about them. Um, but on one point, he just wrote, "I don't think we'll have another kid." And I thought that's interesting. Why did he write it? Um, so I made up a bit out of this that maybe it was a bit too loud at home. Blah blah blah. All these things. So it's this um, solitude versus being a um, being somebody who has a family and, and, and is a people's guy too. So I made up a bit my own Alfred Wegener, obviously. So speaking of children, uh, you spend a, quite a bit of time in the book exploring his childhood yeah. uh, when he's growing up in an orphanage, which is fair. I mean, he's not an orphan. His parents run an orphanage. So he's growing up with all these children around him. Um, for your purposes as a novelist, why did you think that was important? Because that was the most liberal part. With the rest, I'm, I, I try to stay close to reality. But as pretty much nothing is known about his childhood. That was when I could invent everything, when I could lay down some traces that later on in his, during his life could, could be, um, do a, 
a graphic or a, 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 a you, you could you could bring out some symbols or ideas or his interest in ants, uh, for example, or his interest in um, movements. Uh, mm. I, I imagine that he, he, he might see movements different than all of us. So maybe that made him get this idea that even things that seem to be stable to us might move. Um, so that was like, and it was Berlin in the 1880s, which was an interesting time. And this being part of an orphanage without being an orphan. So right. you have all this solitude, but many times uh, is this, uh, are they, are these orphanage, orphans part of the family or are they on their own? All these questions are lovely to, to yeah, I mean, it has so many different layers to uh, his story. Or, for example, and, his, his father was a minister. Um, right. So he found answers to all the human questions in religion, while Alfred Wegener started to doubt these certainties. Uh, so he had to care about where could he find answers if not in religion. So he decided for the first time in, in his old family, they were all ministers, all his grandfathers and all so on. So he, he was the first one who said, I will rely on science. Um, so that, that, that made a an, an conflict with his, with his father, which is interesting throughout the novel as a, as a yeah, energy field for his, for his uh, well, he, he wants to rely on science, and obviously the Greenland expedition is scientific. But beyond science, do you sense that there was a true spirit of adventure pushing him? Do you read this as a story of adventure? Strangely enough, not at all, even though it... It is very adventurous, but he, he didn't have a notion of adventure. He didn't do it for adventurous reasons. For he, he neither did it for national reasons. At this time, many adventures were led to conquer land or to uh, put the flag of your country anywhere where no one has had been. He didn't care at all. He wanted some money from the, from the Kaiser, from the king. Uh, but... Uh, Beside that, he, he 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 didn't care. And same with the with the adventure. He he wasn't proud of what he what he did. Uh, he he didn't like to tell stories about it. So it was I had to go there because I wanted to measure things there. So I went there. He, for example, the anorak. Uh, he he and he and he, he brought it back from Greenland because he thought it's clever. It's a good idea. So he went to a, to a company and said, can you copy this for me? Then you can use it free to, to sell them to the, your clients. So he, he brought the concept of Anorak to, 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 to the Western uh, wow. hemisphere. What about you? Does adventure draw you? W whether I love adventures? I do, but for example, years ago, I, I, I went to Iceland and I, I wanted to cross the, the, the country. And then in, in, in August, it was a, the, the earliest break of winter ever measured. And so we had a very difficult time for some weeks. Um, but I'm not an adventurist. Uh, I am. That's why I write novels. <laughs> so, so you, you can, can, you can spend the adventures in, in the safety of your city. Because I, I think I read um, somewhere where it said Hanser, your publishing house, uh, translated uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Yes. Yes. We have I, a assume, yeah. I assume that had been translated before. What do yeah. you want to do with it? This is a, um, a series where we do new translation of, of classics because translations get old and from time to time you want it to be 
new and perfect, perfectly done. And how was that received? Very well. The, the whole series is, is, is this, this is a very bibliophile uh, thing uh, with all kinds of comments and uh, the translators have years for, for, for translating. So it's a, it's, it's a lovely series. So other than uh, Treasure Island, what were some of the other classics? That you Moby know? Dick and Flaubert and Dostoevsky. Uh, so it's the, the 19th century, uh, the, the, the bourgeois novels uh, that, that created our concept of, of novel. Which is also interesting because these novels, I mean, we read them, at least I read them as a child as adventure novels. You know, yeah. we were, I'm not necessarily as uh, literary classic, um, great adventure novels of people going to unknown corners of the mm -hmm. world. And uh, I was thinking, I wonder what the pandemic will do to it, this idea, because that's some ways the pandemic has also made us aware that if you go to these unknown corners of the world and you can bring back viruses that you yeah. didn't know existed. Yeah, yeah. It, the whole notion of, um, I mean, we, we got so used that everything is possible and it reminded it that is pretty much, we had, we, we were lucky that for so, I mean, many people had predicted the return of the important pandemics way earlier than it finally happened. In the book, uh, you, uh, you know, you, you mentioned already that it is, there's a lot that is about solitude, the need for solitude. And in fact, there's a line that this is when he's in Greenland and he's sitting in the snow and says, this is truly the loneliest place in the world. And lonely, of course, is different from solitude in a certain way, because I, do, I don't think he felt lonely yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Um, and it made me wonder whether uh, this expedition, whether science is obviously important, but whether it was also a very social, a good socially respectable way for someone like Alfred Wegner to get the hell away from yeah. family. Towards. To run away. Yeah, that, that was my Im impression, that, that it also opened a door to to new worlds and 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 the thing is if you can choose uh, i mean why did he choose to always go to the north to the snow to the cold um what made him look out uh, his colleagues went to africa i don't know uh, but he de decided to go there and so the novel tries to find answers for for these questions and it's it's obviously what I like. I myself like to go to to the mountains and to the to the north and to the snow, and I like the reduction. Um, so, and, and I'm sure that that Alfred Wegener liked this too. If you if you reduce colors, for example, uh, when he went back from crossing Greenland, he totally freaked out when he saw it, the first small 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 stone and he saw all the colors in this stone obviously there, there weren't a lot of colors but it, it, when, you, when you've for weeks and weeks only saw the blue of the sky and the white of the of the snow you're you're pretty impressed by how colorful a, sing, a simple stone can be or for example after he spent his first winter on, on Greenland and then the sun came back very low on the horizon. And he said, everybody, animals and everybody went out to throw a shadow just to, to, to get back to the idea of, of things can have a shadow. So it's this reduction and then realizing how beautiful or how important or how meaningful simple things can be. And that's, I mean, that's what we love in, in, in novels. Did you also find I mean, going to Greenland, spending time there is for would for many people even now uh, would be a once in a life. You know, the thing you would call a once in a lifetime 
adventure. It's not something people would necessarily want to repeat again. Mm-hmm. And but back in that time, when it was much more difficult to even do all of this, he went back. Mm-hmm. And that is what I actually find the most interesting about uh, his story uh, is that most of books like this is about one expedition, you know, so one expedition to the top of Mount Everest, yeah, one yeah. expedition to the Antarctic. But this is a man who keeps going back. And uh, th- I mean, what are you, th- what is your idea about what kept pulling him? That, that's what makes him a scientific, scientist and not an adventurer. The adventurer would look out for new adventures. Yeah, yeah because that adventure like he, is done. The idea of science is you start with some questions and in the end you don't get answers, you get more questions. So every time he came back with new question and he thought, oh, I should, I should one day go back um, because now I want to... I want to compare timelines. I want to have better material to get deeper into the eyes, uh, to get, the, it's funny what they do. For example, they had all these balloons there. And um, what is it? A, you say dragon? Uh, um, no, a kite. They had k- kites. Um, um, so it's a childish thing to, to have balloons and kites, but that's pretty much what they did there all, all, all the day to, to, to measure temperature in the, uh, of the air um, levels. So he came back to do better measurements and to, to go deep inside Greenland and so on. So that, yeah. Did he, in his journals, also express the sense of mortality that, you know, there is a line where um, you know, he's leaving his wife and is on the shore seeing him and he's, you know, he's not sure whether they'll be, when he's coming back, whether they will be there mm-hmm. to welcome him back or whether he's going to come back. But did that weigh on him at all? It was, he, 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 he knew how dangerous it, it was. So he didn't, he didn't think he is, um, what, what's the word? Um, he, 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 the gods are mortal. He, he didn't mortal. thought, thought he's immortal. Um, right. um, um, for, there's one strange story. Uh, I always thought he is an historic person because he died in, in 1930 days after his 50th birthday and I thought well he's this is just historic and then I um, then my mother called me she came back from holiday where she met a woman and and they talked about their kids and and she said well my son is writing a novel about Alfred Wegener and the other woman was a care keeper in a old people's house and she said oh i'm actually carrying alfred wegner's daughter um and i thought well she's alive so i i went there immediately and and met this very very old very friendly woman and she was the daughter the 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 youngest daughter of alfred wegner um still alive and she told me and i hadn't realized that they had to say goodbye to their father and different to now they didn't realize they didn't know whether he was still alive or not it was a bit like a schrodinger's cat mm. uh, and they knew they will only get news from him when the ships can go back and forward in next spring so it was until april that they realized that he had died in in november um, and until then, he was neither alive nor dead because there was just no news at all. And I think it takes some inner strength for both for him to leave his family and for the family to let him go. His, his, and her mother, his wife, 
wrote a memoir, right? Yeah. Um, heroes are not always so heroic at home. Uh, what did they think of the husband and father who kept leaving? Well, I think, I don't know whether they are close to what they felt back in the time. <laughs> Later on, for example, the Nazis made him a, tried to make him a German hero, which was ridiculous. Um, but later on when they realized that he was right i think they had doubts too whether he was right or not with his theories so back in the days they didn't know whether it's worth it to do all these things uh, because they just saw that he has pro problems to get a academic statue uh, becoming a right. professor and so on so probably they thought it would be easier for us if he would do normal no. things. Um, uh, but that's always different from a posteriori or when you are living it. Well, at least they got to uh, see their father's theories vindicated, yeah. right? Um, which he obviously didn't, but they, they got uh, that much... That must have been, because even his wife lived till what, 100 or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, were they honored or something? I mean, did, when his theories were finally of continental drift were accepted, um, were they recognized or? Yes, uh, yeah. Um, they, it, it must have been a, a, a huge feeling of, of pride or, or yeah, acceptance that, that it That's was worth it. That's too. I, I yeah. imagine there must have been yeah. must be very sad because the yeah. main person who did it yeah. is uh, not around. Yeah. That's that. Um, but what was the daughter like? Well, she. This is a very complicated story, and it, it need another hour to to discuss that. <laughs> because as as I said, the Nazis tried to make him a German hero, right. so they married his daughters to Nazi Germans, um, and so she was married to a, a very strange guy. And after after the war, they pretty much hide throughout their lives in southern germany and and so she led a she led a strange life where she didn't mention alfred wegener at all but she, they picked new names and so on so it's a it's a criminal story uh, uh, around her wow um, but uh, did she get to see the book or did she die before the book came out i sent it to her but then i heard that she was already in pretty much dementia and died shortly afterwards. I thought, I think she saw it, but I don't think she, she was able to read it. Uh, but there, there are um, kids from her who came to my reading tour and wrote me letters. So there are people are uh, thinking that it's lovely to, to see their ancestor being portrayed. So this theory of continental drift that he held on to so deeply, um, what do we know about why he came upon it? I mean, what suggested it to him that the continentals, that the continents might be in fact drifting apart? I think that everybody, didn't you, as a child, when you saw a globe, you realized that the shape of Africa, the Eastern coast of, uh, Africa, uh, no, the western coast of Africa and the eastern coast of South America fit together easily. Right. And so all, already Alexander von Humboldt had the theory years and years before Alfred Wegener. It's, it's just that it was so impossible to think it. Um, so people let go of this idea that, 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 that this is a, an interesting random azar. Um, uh, people didn't, didn't know about it. And Alfred Wegener was just from his character so 
energetic that he didn't get let go. So he um, checked that very strange animals lived on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, nowhere else, but, but there. There, there. There's an animal, um, a, a turtle that lives in South America and goes over to Africa all the, uh, all the way to put down the eggs and swims back. In the beginning, that was pretty close, but it's over the years, it became more and more difficult. The mute became very long. To do this. And there are diamond, diamond um, structures in the ground that continue pretty much from here to here. Uh, so there are plants that are closed there. Are, so he followed throughout the disciplines and that was pretty much Alfred Wegener that he, he, he didn't say, I'm a meteorologist, this is not my field. He, right. he said, I'm curious and I want to know everything about it from all disciplines. And so he, yeah, and that's why no one believed him because they said, you are not one of us, you don't know us stuff um you're, a you're strange the guy. weather guy yeah you're the weather guy stay on your field we don't we don't we don't tell you what the weather is doing you don't tell us what the geology or anything is doing um yeah so he just collected material and proofs but they said that the problem was that they said you can't give a reason why the continents are drifting that was right he didn't care about the reason. He just said, it's a fact. We don't know why, but they wanted a reason. The strange thing that when he became a professor in Graz in Austria, the one person who was um, working on these magma, magmatic magma, yeah. um, things where the continents swim on, he was some offices beside, he was pretty much his neighbor at the university, but they didn't like each other. He was, he was not sympathetic. So they didn't speak together and they could have helped each other, but they didn't. He doesn't seem like, he, um, Alfred Wigner was probably a difficult person, it seems like. I mean, he's not like the guy you would yeah. necessarily go hang out at the pub with over a beer and I think the other one was even more <laughs> but did it did it affect him deeply that nobody in the scientific community believed him? yeah he he found one guy who believed him and he felt so close to him that he married his daughter <laughs> I think that that, that he, he also loved her but he, he really opened his heart to the family because he felt accepted. And, you know, I mean, when you spend that much time write, reading this man's journals, as you say, you as a novelist, you're reading the journals for other clues, uh, things that will help you. At the end of it, did you have a different sense of Alfred Wegener? than the one you started out with, the impression you started with. Absolutely. For, ex for example, just this, what I loved most of him was the, if he started something, he finished it. For example, he, his, his brother was, was great in flying balloons. What, what is it? Is it a balloon? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. the hot air balloons. Yeah, yeah. Hot air balloon, yeah. So they, one day they started, they pretty much didn't take anything with them. They just wanted to measure again the, the the temperature up there, and then it took them from the south of Germany until Denmark in the north, and they thought maybe we should go down. It's pretty cold, but why not go on? And then they the wind brought them back, and and in the end, they I think they doubled the record of staying in the in the air the existing European uh, uh, or the world record because they just they kept at it everything they did they kept at it can you relate to that kind of obsession yes absolutely 
<laughs> I, and I think that that's that's pretty close to writing a novel. You, on one day, you just have to be so in it that it's it's this marathon thing that you that you 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 need to focus on things. And he was good in focusing on things. Well, that's actually a very interesting thing. Uh, you know, thinking of novels as sort of getting up on a hot air balloon and yeah. you just, and you have no idea and you keep going. And, yeah. You know, you think yeah. you're just going there, but in fact, before you know it, yeah. you've gone way off course somewhere else. You know that being an, a, a writer your, yourself, that that you have to you have to accept that it can lead you anywhere you where you didn't plan to go and then sometime you write the novel sometimes the novel writes you and you have to you have to accept this in your case what was it that was the novel writing you i started it i i pretty much put hot air in the balloon that was my part and then I just followed the, the, the wind. But maybe everybody of us has, has a different point of view being up there in this balloon. And so the, the map that you're drawing would be different, even though you see maybe the same things. Sure. You know, this, I, I mean, I'm so fascinated by this idea of what lets a man hold on so firmly to his belief when nobody else, including the experts in the field, mm. believe you. And, uh, you know, everybody must have thought, oh, he's like this nutcase who goes around talking about drifting continents. Um, and compared to the last time when we talked on stage in Kolkata, I think at the end of you know, having seen this pandemic unfold, you also realize that uh, that that certainty that we have with that science has all the answers that the expert knows. All of that has been blown out of the water mm. for us. I mean, it, we have seen the top scientists around the world kind of making up the answers as they go along. You know, what was taken as fact one year ago about COVID and how to deal with COVID is not necessarily regarded as that kind of fact anymore. So in a sense, uh, I mean, his story. I lost you. I don't know whether you lost me or I lost you. So I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, Ah, you're back. Um, yeah. Was I frozen or were you frozen? Um, well, it says my internet connection is okay. unstable. Good. So some one of us, well, which is perfectly uh, appropriate for when we're talking about continents being unstable. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so far away. Um, no, you're absolutely right. But I, I think, for example, I, I don't know how it is in India, but over here, this is the idea of science that you doubt, that you are not necessarily always sure about the answers, but that you accept this process to be part of scientific um, proce procedure. Um, and all everybody who says, ha, 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 scientists uh, f fail. Well, they don't fail, they, they do what they are supposed to do. Um, researching and getting answers one after the other. The fact that we invented this, this, these vaccines is incredibly, I mean, who would have guessed that, that the world is so quick in, in developing vaccines? But you're right. There is one danger in, 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 the, in Alfred Wegener's life as an example. If you take him as an example, don't trust science because there was Alfred Wegener. Um, the fact that there was one guy who was right, even though everybody else said you're wrong, doesn't mean that everybody who says I'm right and the others are wrong is right. It's the same problem in literature. We have the example of Franz Kafka, who was always not 
seen as what he is, one of the biggest author of the 20th century. And all the authors now who have no success at all say, well, I'm the next Franz Kafka. No, you are not from me. Uh, so you, you can't take this as, an, as a proof of, of, uh, of you being right if, if no one accepts you. That's, that's the problem we have to, we have to live with. He, his example reminds us that, there, that there's no certainty, but it doesn't necessarily mean everyone who's supposed to be wrong is right. Yes. It doesn't, I mean, everybody is not an Alfred, every crackpot out there is not an Alfred Wagner, even though other people at his time called him yeah. a crackpot. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that is what, 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 was, what was incredible during, during all, who, who, what is still incredible during the pandemic, that all the people in, in Germany, for example, they say, oh, we are oppressed like during Nazi Germany um, because of these COVID strategies and uh, our liberties are taken away from us and, and this is a dictatorship and so on, or science is a dictatorship and so on. It's nuts. Um, it's not, you're, you're, you're not Alfred Wegener. Yeah, well, we're probably going to have to, uh, I mean, I think that's a very good note to end it on to remind people that, you know, Alfred Wegener was special, which is why you have written a novel based on his life. I mean, if he was genuinely a crackpot uh, who was wrong in his beliefs, there were a lot of people out there who held on to wrong beliefs. They probably would not have merited uh, such a novel. But uh, thank you very much, Yul Enwell, for uh, spending this hour chatting with us. And uh, let you. me turn it over to Vishan Pramadar and Seagal Bush. Bishan. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yo, uh, for this wonderful evening of conversation. We spoke about books, about adventure, about COVID, about publishing as well. So it's been a fantastic uh, one hour. Uh, thank you very much. And we hope to see you again. I, while we end our session today, I'd like to uh, already invite everybody who's watching uh, to the sixth installment of this dialogue between two writers uh, organized by uh, Getty Institute Maxwell Bhavan Kolkata and Seagull Books. Uh, that will happen on the 10th of September, which is uh, in a few weeks time. Uh, Sandeep Roy will be talking to German poet and scholar Dus Grunbein. Uh, we hope to see you then and thank you everybody for joining us today. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bishan. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.